Christ. Okay. Across the UK, elite helicopter teams are saving lives every day. Uh, bringing the hospital to the roadside in a race against time. Now we're going to straighten his leg out. Right. Right, if you grab his leg. Right. Oh! These are their stories. Minutes, you can you just stay still? We're going to get you out. That's it. It's a big release. Come and give me a kiss if you want. Yeah. She's been an absolute star and very, very brave. It's all right, sweetheart. Valley Airport, operation center of the Great North Air Ambulance Service. The charity gets thousands of calls each year. Today, paramedic Jane Peacock is manning the air desk. Hello, Air Ambulance. Right, and do they not say whether he's got neuro deficit or how has he sustained them? A trained paramedic answers the red phone to try and sift out the more serious jobs from the less serious. I'll ring this number, get some more info, and I'll let you know what we're doing. All right, bye. If we were busy on jobs that were less serious and a, a really serious job came in, we wouldn't be available to go and help save them. Hello, Air Ambulance. A report has come in of a life-threatening accident only four miles from base. Oh, dear me. OK, I'll flash on to Andy while I get ready. Yeah. Andy, Dion! Have you got the dress actually? Because uh, yes. it might be first on scene. Oh. Diligence. Thank you. My pleasure. Is that the dress? Dilgrove or Dil Diligence? Diligence? Yeah. Very nice. nice. The helicopter is the fastest way to the accident, but it will still take seven minutes. The more information we get about an incident before we arrive, the more prepared we are for it. We've got a better idea of what we're going to need to do when we arrive on scene. Oh, it's just down here somewhere. We try to have a quick chat about the job to decide who's going to do what on scene. But obviously, not knowing exactly what's going on before you arrive um, adds a bit of uncertainty. Uh, down here on this junction, the white van stop with first on scene. Nobody there, just people running around you. Are you looking? Uh, 10 o'clock. Right, well, we can't fit anywhere down there. Uh... We're gonna have to go this field here. Right, I'll just come round this way and then turn round back into wind. Yeah, that field's a good option, actually. Straight down the road. We're gonna have to take everything, Dion, yeah, but nobody's there. I was gonna say, it's not far, so all no. the deep stuff. Yeah, suction, everything. Still under the car. Not only is it really fast using the helicopter, it also gives you a bird's eye view of the scene, which is really helpful because we were a little unclear on what actually we were going to on this job. Right, clear out, everybody. The incident turned out to be a number of streets away in the middle of a housing estate. Lucky for us, the bystander had seen where we were landing, came to escort us to where we were actually going. Is he still under the car? Yes, he is. Okay, That's your seat, thanks, Jane. In the few minutes it took to get to the incident, the ambulance service and the fire crews had arrived. 
Initially, when we got there, we couldn't quite work out what happened. It was all a little bit confusing. It looked like a, a car had basically mounted the pavement, gone through a lamppost, and then hit a pedestrian, ending up against another parked car, and the pedestrian had been crushed between the two vehicles. Let's go ahead. Yeah, Jane, think that was RSI. Over. RSI or rapid sequence induction, is using drugs to get a tube down a patient's windpipe. It was safer to give him an anaesthetic and pop him off to sleep so that we could take over his breathing and keep him safe for the transfer into hospital. Side, 19 year old Carl has been crushed between two cars, sustaining substantial injuries. At the time, we didn't know exactly what had happened. It looked like and the patient had just been walking down the road, and all of a sudden, a car had uh, mounted the pavement, gone through a lamppost, and then hit a pedestrian, ending up against another parked car with quite nasty head and face injuries. Yeah. You alright, Carl? Right. Carl. You okay? Fantastic, man. Carl's mom and sister only found out about the accident minutes ago. It's sad to think that if he left home either 30 seconds earlier or 30 seconds later, then the car probably would have missed him. And you've got some fentanyl in the fire. All right, Carl, just relax. Instead, I'm left with a young lad in front of me who's fighting for his life. Carl, off to sleep, sweetheart. Yep, Carl is put into an induced coma for the journey to hospital. Which way to the aircraft? Ambulance and then the end of the street. You're going straight down there? Straight down. Right. It's been 33 minutes since the crew arrived on scene. I know from evidence that if patients don't get to the hospital within the first hour when they've sustained serious injury, their chances of survival diminishes enormously. Yep, that's it, where the bollards are. So that's why using a helicopter can make the difference between life and death. Move out of the way, please. Bye. It's just four minutes to James Cook Hospital by air, compared to 20 minutes by road. That side, guys. Off we go. Keep him high, please. Thank you very much. Got our own two. Got that. Then let's go ahead. Candy, can you free an eye, James Cook, please? 19, one nine-year-old male, pedestrian. He's been uh, reversed over, trapped between two cars. Right, right, get going. Hi, Mother, it's just Andy uh, from the air ambulance. I've got a trauma pre alert for you. Right, starting. He's got a significant head injury and max fax injuries. Uh, he has been RSI at scene due to cerebral agitation. Thank you very much, Chief Raj. Sarah's back.
Right, three greens down unlocked and the brakes are on. You two are both loose and about everything else is good to land. Are you happy, guys? Yeah. Okay, just read some numbers. Pulse 91, SAS 100. BP No problems with the tube, uh, he's got good bilateral air entry on his chest, belly soft, his pelvis is splinted, legs are okay, he's got a big laceration under that right arm in his axilla, that's all there is to tell. I want to be honest and open with them because that's what I would want myself. No doctor can say 100% this person's going to be fine and they're going to live happy ever after because nobody actually knows. I'm happy with that, mate. Yeah. Uh, with everything. We get called to lots of incidents where people have made a poor decision and that's what's resulted in the accident. However, in Carl's case, it looks like, you know, he was literally just in the wrong place at the wrong time. It's awful and he's been very unlucky, but we can't let it get to us, otherwise we couldn't continue to do this job. Carl will be kept safely in the induced coma until he's been scanned and the full extent of his injuries has been assessed by the hospital team. This is the other lovely side of the job. It's cleaning. There's a distinct difference here. Paramedics clean things properly. Doctors just wing over it. They, you know, look. What's that? I said it needed a wash. Mom's you said it off. needs a catch wash. I, I don't call that a catch myself. Minger. Jay, we would have been so much quicker, but she's been OCD cleaning. So you've been cleaning the scoop? I've been cleaning it properly. Where Not is it? Not bloody doctor's out the Where job. Where is it? You've got it? No, the land crew half-inched it back. You're kidding me! <laughs> oh, you're having a laugh. Time to go. Oh, here, no. I can't have that. <laughs> Jay, we can't have gone. <laughs> yeah. I'll be really impressed if she comes back up here with that scoop. There we go. Happy days. That was fear. The crews were like, oh my god, the wrath of Jane will give her the scoop. Just run it in there, girl. Okay, my love. I'm on it. One hundred and seventy miles southeast at Norwich International Airport, the crew of the East Anglian Air Ambulance Service are making the most of their downtime. So, as you walk to the car, what you see is you've got a male lying on the road, as you see, that a dent to the bonnet of a car under the bullseye to the windscreen. Not only is Dr. Victor Inyang on call today, but he's also training medical students. When I interviewed for, for the air ambulance back in 1995 at the registrar, uh, it's quite a competitive process. Um, and so what, what the students are doing now is giving themselves an edge. So that when they come to, to compete for air ambulance jobs, they've shown an aptitude and a desire to chase the, um, the subspecialty. He stepped out on the road, unfortunately, and as I described, hit by the car. Whoops, sorry. We'll pick, it up. we'll pick up on that when I come back. All right. One of the first things the students will learn from us is that this is an unpredictable job, and you never quite know when you're going to get called out. Morning, Norwich. Um, this is an emergency line for the air ambulance, mate, so can you hang up? Yes. Doing a Barney double blazing. Oh, oh, no one ever rings that line unless it's our control. So, 
Um, every time that rings, we expect a job. But it's a bloke trying to sell us some double glazing. <laughs> oh, the coal springs, just... Uh... <laughs> this time, it really is a matter of life or death. Paramedics in the village of Snettisham have requested an air ambulance for an urgent transfer to hospital. A 66-year-old man has collapsed with serious chest pains. Ambulance emergency, tell me exactly what's happened. Uh, I live alone and I think I might be having a heart attack, I'm not sure. So, to describe what's happening? I'm sweating profusely and I can't get my breath very easily. Right, OK, so we've got help organised for you. I'm going to sit down the line with you. Right. Okay, if anything changes, just let me know. Okay. Day one, the ambulance crew are going to meet you at Spetisham Primary School. Grid reference of Tango Foxtrot 687342. Um, I know exactly where that is. It's right next to the church. To make extraction quicker, the land ambulance is bringing the patient from his home to a cricket pitch in the village. I think they're still there. I can see the ambulance outside the house still. Yeah, I can run over overhead and now heading to the cricket pitch over. In the setting of a patient having a cardiac arrest, you want to get the patient into the hospital quickly. For those patients who don't live near a major cardiac unit, that's where the air ambulance comes into its own to get them there quickly. Angry one on the ground. Are you right, Miguel? Yes, mate. Yeah. Angry one. Um, just let you know the crew has just left scene. It should move you any minute now. Yeah, it's all received. They're now arriving. Gentleman's name? So, gentleman, it's Philip. Hello, Philip. Yeah. Got a complaint of central chest pain. Got clammy, nauseous. Shortness of breath. For about half past eight this morning. Okay. Vomited once. Went upstairs. Collapsed, which is when he called us. Philip. Hang on, mate. Okay, we're going to rest, mate. This blood pressure is so low. His condition is deteriorating. It's going to be kind of arrest. Okay. So we get someone straight on the chest. Okay. Let's just start chest compressions. Okay. Helimed 85 have been called to transport a patient with serious chest pains to hospital. OK, everybody staying clear. Shocking now. Just minutes after arriving on scene, Philip's heart stops beating. So, I'd want to do the airway, please. OK, two minutes. OK, stop what we're doing. Uh, do we have a pulse? Yeah, there is a pulse. Yeah, a pulse. OK, so I'm still going to ventilate him. So, Victor, I think we should go for a tube on this patient. OK. okay. Okay. With the patient in cardiac arrest, it is essential we take over the patient's breathing to ensure sufficient oxygen is getting to the brain to reduce the risk of brain damage. Just a minute, just a minute. Uh, we probably need a better bougie. That one's a bit, uh, it's quite rigid. It's really long... yeah. From the time you give the drug to you pass the tube, you hold your breath. And if you need to breathe, the patient needs to breathe. And that's how long you have. You happy to have another go, Vicky? Yeah. yeah. OK, can I have the young blade, please? Let's have a look. Okay. The tube is not going down Philip's windpipe. He isn't breathing, and time is running out. No, no, okay. let's, let's go with Nigel. OK, ready? Right, yeah. I think that's in. OK, let's secure that and let's go. The Norfolk and Norwich cardiac unit is over an hour away by road, but only 20 minutes by air. It's weighing up benefits versus uh, risks. If Philip had a second cardiac arrest in flight, it becomes more difficult to deal with that in the aircraft. I still think we should fly him. Do you? Right, OK. Because time is of the essence for this yeah. chap. On this occasion, we felt, with Philip, the benefits of flying him to the right hospital quickly far outweighed the risk of him having a further cardiac arrest in flight. Ready, set, lift. Right. 
you can only hope that you made the right decision. Okay, once we get on, we get on the ventilator. Hang on, okay, thanks for your help, guys. Even after 25 years, I still get challenged every day. I still stop and think, wow, that was an interesting case. OK, that's my first intubation I haven't got in 10 years. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad it was you, not me. <laughs> we love challenges, come on. We like patients to push us. <laughs> Philip's heart rate is dropping to a dangerously low level. Without intervention, he will certainly arrest again. Uh, just start pacing a bit. It really just increase output to 70. The air ambulance carries a piece of equipment that can act as a pacemaker. That is the final option to stop another cardiac arrest. Covering 50 miles in just 18 minutes, Helimed 85 touches down at the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital. Okay, and all the way now. Okay, there we go. He's quite, he's quite tall. When you're ready, I'll do a very brief handover because he's not very well. This is a 66 year old gentleman, chest pain at about 8 this morning, inferior MI. Cardiac arrest at about 0940, VF arrest, one shock came out of it. He went very bradycardic en route and in spite of 3 milligrams of atropine was dropping to about 20 per minute. So he's being paced at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Very nice. Thank you. The decision to fly Philip um, definitely paid off. But he's not out of danger. He still has the risk of going to cardiac arrest. So there's no way of being certain that he will get through. Philip will undergo an angiogram to determine the location of the blockage in his arteries before receiving treatment. Hey, Norwich Tower. Good morning. Hello, Med uh, 85. Just lifted from the end then. Would we like to join for this on the boundary? Hello, Med 85. Uh, Roger. VFR, far above 1,000 feet, please. Traffic in the circuit, left hand. 1,600. Save day, Victor. Well, I like these jobs because they always make the doctors nervous for the families. Yeah, <laughs> What's there to be nervous about? Yeah. Yeah. If there's a tube you don't want to miss, Victor. No, 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 no. Penrith in Cumbria. It's business as usual for the crew of the Great North Air Ambulance Service. Today, Laura Atwood is the doctor on duty. I'm a lieutenant colonel in the Army Reserve. I've been in there for 13 years. I think the military can point you towards having a nice regular routine and it does give you that control in your life to make you work by. He's doing a good job. I think Mark's out of 10, I give him a good 10 out of 10. In between incidents, we don't mind keeping busy on base. There's always things to do. But as doctors and paramedics, when that red phone rings, we're ready for action. Windermere. Yeah, what's the details? OK, uh, give me a quick, please. All right, thank you very much. They're on their way. It 
It's a 14-minute flight to Windermere, where a tree surgeon has had a substantial fall. Laura, this is Stu who's behind me. Okay, talk to me, what were you doing? How high up were you and what happened? I dropped down in, from the red rope into the other limb and I had a secondary line on. Okay. I was just attaching another secondary line and was just waiting that and um, whether something snapped or, or, or... Okay, how did you land as you are now? Almost exactly in the recovery okay. position, yeah. It looked like he'd fallen roughly 10 metres from the tree onto the tarmac. If he had landed onto his head or chest, it could have been quite a different story, maybe even fatal. Also, if he'd fallen a few more inches to the right, he could have landed on his chainsaw, so that could have caused quite significant injuries to his lower limbs. Just talk to me, where's the main pain for back. you? In my back. The lower back. What about around the hips or down that right leg um, particularly? Well, there's a general stiffness developing and a tingling sensation in my right toes. Having that tingling in his toes pinpoints towards potentially a fracture to the lower spine, which is what I was concerned about. We'll just take it nice and slow and just get you feeling more comfortable first of all. So I'm going to put this collar on. If we were to move him in an awkward manner, it could potentially increase the damage to his fracture, which could lead to permanent damage to the spinal cord. OK, on roll. Ready, steady. Roll. Fantastic. OK, now I've got the back of your neck. I'm going to pop that underneath just so it's comfy for you. OK. Any pain in that side of your hip at all? Just slight muscular, I would okay. say. But... Anything coming down this leg? No, it's more underneath. More on that lower back. Though. The two concerns was either the lower lumbar spine fracture or a pelvic fracture, and the problem is the two can present fairly similar. So we just assume the worst automatically and therefore put the pelvic binder on and keep his spine immobilised. Can you straighten your legs out for us? Would that be OK? Yeah. And is that sore in the back? It's underneath. Underneath there, OK. Right, I'm just going to pop a little drip in your hand so we can give you some painkillers, OK? I mean, so really, we're probably just lower back pelvis stew. What's the nearest place from here is...? Preston will be our deal from there. <laughs> what the patient wants. <laughs> Luckily for him, the closest major trauma centre is Preston. And we can get him there in minutes, where a road journey would take up to an hour. Right, just a little bit of morphine going in. And then what we'll do after this is put you on this yellow scoop just so we can lift you and then get you onto the back of the helicopter, OK? Right, should we lift up? Yeah. Sometimes you can have patients who are chatting and talking to you, but you need to keep a close eye on them because things can change quite quickly with them. So certainly when people are quite badly injured, um, especially in the younger population, they can really sort of hold their own for a period of time and manage their pain quite well. But actually, in the space of one or two minutes, it can sort of dramatically take a downward spiral. We do have to watch out for that. Just lift it up a second, that's lovely, thanks. So, SAT's 97, heart rate 64. Yeah, yeah, three, five, seventy-five year old male, fallen out of tree, landing on tarmac. Um, he is average 86, CP uh, 90. Public. Has had morphine to pain relief, which is packaged. Uh, and we'd be at Preston in about 1818 minutes. Yeah, that's what she's making good pressure around for you. Yeah, Roger, cheers, man. Oh, it's just a
On Ready? three, one, two, three. From a &E, Matt will go into the CT scanner. All his injuries will be looked at and imaged to check for any sort of fractures, any internal bleeding, any organ damage. So he's not out of the woods yet. He's still got to have some assessments and imaging done first. Tees Valley Airport, the Great North Air Ambulance Team are halfway through their 10-hour shift. Yeah, that's Mark speaking. One male with serious leg injury, one male with serious chest injury. An urgent request to scramble has come in. Smashing. Six three are on the way, mate. Cheers. Thanks. Bye bye. When we arrived on scene, there was no other medical personnel there. It was just the police. We right. were directed to Johnny, who'd been thrown about 20 foot down a, an embankment in the bushes. The land ambulance was just a few minutes away, so they dealt with Stuart, the other biker, who wasn't as serious. Hiya, Johnny. Hiya. Right. You see that he's got pain all down his left hand side. OK. He's trying to just kill pause. He was trying to get pins and needles in his fingers. OK. Pins and needles can be a worrying sign suggesting that he may have injured either his neck or his back and done some damage to his spinal column. Being cool. Just slowly breathe in now for us, just nice and slow. Good man. While Jane and Dion assess Johnny, the land ambulance team treat his friend Stuart, the other biker, who has less serious injuries. Uh, what we found at the moment, love? Yeah. All right, you broke this leg. Right. We're going to put a little plastic tube into one of your veins. We're going to give you some strong pain. All right? Probably not remember most of this, all right? Johnny, you're going to feel a little scratch in your arm here, OK? Good man. Thanks, thank you. Just keep hold of his head. Don't, don't, no, no, just keep hold of it, yeah. Are you his mum? OK. This is mum. Oh, right, this is mum. I've got no idea what happened. I was in front. Um, I just knew the wind behind us, so I turned around and came back and saw them all over the road. Mum, can I get you to just hold his head a second? Yeah. Right, what's going to happen now? We're going to straighten his leg out. Right. He's going to shout and scream, but he's not going to remember anything about us. OK? Breathe. Oh. Breathe. Breathe. Perfect. Yeah. Oh. There you go, that's a hold of there. Jane, just while he's in that position, do you want to see if you can get this under him? Oh. Oh. Yeah. 
Ready, steady, roll. Oh. Motorcyclists do often sustain multiple serious life-threatening injuries because they've got nothing else to protect them. Our cannula pack in that green drugs pack, Jay, packed away. We suspect that Johnny's broken his leg, but we also worry that he might have done damage internally and he could be bleeding. Can you hold this leg, please? Oh. Johnny's legs weren't in a normal position. They were bent, but he could also have damaged his pelvis. So we had to straighten out his legs and put a bind around his pelvis to try and prevent any further internal bleeding. Helicopter, we're going to take you up to the hospital, okay? Where's your mum? Your mum's coming up in a car, she's falling up in a car. While Helimed 63 takes Johnny on his 13 minute flight to the RVI in Newcastle, his friend Stuart is loaded into the police helicopter and will follow shortly. My job encompasses a whole package because it's about treating a patient as a person. They are real, they have feelings, they have real pain, and it's about supporting them. Hey, Johnny. has to clear the helipad to make room for the police helicopter that is carrying Stuart, the other injured biker. Yeah, there you go. He's got what looks like pain in both shoulders but nothing clinical deformity wise. A lot of pain in his C-spine. Chest and belly are okay. His pelvis, his legs were splayed at scene, so his pelvis is a query. Uh, and he's almost certainly got a shaft, closed shaft femur. His neurology's intact, his numbers have been absolutely fine. It's totally stable, so, yeah. Both Johnny and Stuart will undergo tests and scans to determine the full extent of their injuries. Helipad to clear now. Yeah, yeah, we're good, yep. Okay, we got all the kit back that you took. I'm just tying up one second. I've got your radio up here, Dean. Yeah. Right. We've got both bags. We've got scoop board oh, Hendrix off, off him. Oh, we just should. Yeah, we're getting that there. Yeah. That was it, really, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, that was it. Okie dokie. Here we go. General stiffness developing and a tingling sensation in my right toes. Right, we do have three greens and the brakes are off. Certainly do. Going to cut it from rest. Okay. So we get someone straight on the chest. Yeah, okay, let's just start chest compressions. Without that helicopter, I wouldn't have been here. You realise just how um, fragile <laughs> life can be, if you like. 
because one minute you're fine and then the next minute everything goes wrong. I have a rescue dog buster who is quite a pal. You appreciate things like that probably more so than I did prior to my heart attack. It's a very rewarding feeling that you have in your own little way contributed to a positive outcome and that's what keeps us coming back for more. I think life is ever going to be normal, knowing what I've been through, but I think it's only going to improve me for the future. He did look quite bad. Someone who rang the ambulance also said that he's possibly dead. It's going to be better if like, I just joke about it, just keep it light hard, be light hard about the situation, and just be grateful for those who helped me. Generally speaking, with the patients we deal with, we follow their care for the next few weeks because it's quite nice to know where they ended up and how they did. Right, what's going to happen now? We're going to stick his leg out. He's going to shout and scream, but he's not going to remember anything about us. Oh! There you go, that's a hold of there. To completely heal, I think it's about six months. I would say it could have been a lot worse. That day is brought down as the luckiest day I've ever had. I was a bit put off for the first couple of days when I was in line in hospital and thinking about it. But as of now, I'm really looking forward to getting back on the bike. Bring it on. I think doing this job makes you see that anything can happen to anyone at any time. If you're worried about it all the time, you wouldn't ever do anything. So you may as well just not think about it and get on with life. <laughs>